Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hope everybody's having a good day this Sunday morning. Uh, a couple days after uh, Christmas of uh, 2020. Amen. And God is a God is a good God. He's great. We're going to look at the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, where uh, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, washes the disciples' feet, and he asks a question to uh, Peter and also to the others. So, do you know what I am doing to you? And that's the question. Do we know? And he says, do you know what I'm doing to you? Of course, Peter did not fully understand it or understand much of it. He knew about the ceremonial washing of feet. Uh, he knew that uh, what they had done traditionally, and uh, he understood all that. But Jesus asked a deeper question. And when, and when, the, when we study the Bible, those are the reasons that we know we need to go deeper is when we look at what our Lord is saying. And uh, normally, uh, many things are, are right there in the passage uh, on, the, on the surface. So we can catch so many things. For instance, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So when we look at that, we don't try to spiritualize that. We explain this is what we mean. God so loved, the sacrificial giving love uh, where uh, the father gave his son to die for us. But here in the washing of feet, the Lord is saying, uh, what I'm doing, you don't really understand right now. And so he's leading them to a situation or leading them to a place in their Christian lives and uh, their experience that they will be able to understand what he is talking about. So, uh, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to fellowship together this morning through your word. We ask, Father, that you would continue to guide us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And Father, may you be glorified in our lives as we'll come in this chapter 13, in which we have seen in chapter 12, chapter 11. Be glorified, Father, and may we be built up in the most holy faith. This we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name, and for his sake, amen. So John 13, 1 says this, it says, uh, now before the feast of the Passover, now we've just finished John chapter 12, and, and John chapter 12, uh, we know that uh, that Jesus had told to uh, spoke to his father, and he said, "Father, glorify your name." And the father said that he, had, excuse me, he had glorified it, and that he will continue to glorify it. That's a great note. He says, "I will continue to glorify my life through you." Now, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we pray again how good you are as we think about our Lord and Savior wanting to bring you glory, and then how that's what we want to do in our lives is to bring you glory. May you be glorified in our lives. Praise, Father, praise your holy name. Amen. That's it. That's, that's, the, that, that's the gist. That's what it boils down to. In this Christian life that I'm living, am I giving God the glory? So the Bible tells us right after John chapter 12 and John chapter 13, 1, it says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart, uh, excuse me, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, or he loved them to perfection. He loved them all the way. There was nothing left out concerning love that our Lord had to do. He loved them to the end, to the goal of what love is all about. And so the Bible tells us that, uh, see, he loved them to death. So he was going to die for them. And John 15, 13, again, will tell us, see, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his brothers. And so Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is going, he's loved them to the 
into the ultimate. He's loved them. There is nothing lacking. The Bible says that Jesus knew that his hour was come. And so, again, as we have been saying in this pat in the study of God, of John, we find out that his hour had not yet come. But now in John chapter 13, his hour has come. He's going to Calvary's cross. Praise the Lord. He's going to the cross for us. He's going to die for you and for me. And also what this tells us is that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is omniscient. He knows everything. He's God. He's not a less God than God the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Jesus is the God-man, but he's just as omniscient as the Holy Spirit and God the Father. And so uh, he's omniscient. He knew. Uh, he knew this this knowledge that he had of knowing everything. The Bible tells us about God. It says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning. So God knows, God doesn't learn anything. He doesn't decide anything in the sense that, oh, I didn't know this, and now I'm making a decision based upon new knowledge. He knows everything. And so what I want, what I'm striving to help you to understand is that Jesus is omniscient. He's omniscient. And so uh, he knows everything from the beginning. And so he knew he was going to his father. And now the beautiful thing about this is we can ask ourselves a question and we can answer in the affirmative, answer positively. Because the question is, do we know where we're going when it's time for us to leave this world? And the answer for us as believers is yes. Yes, we're going to live eternally with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise his holy name. Praise God. See, this is not a guess so and a hope so. But do we know where we're going when we die? Absolutely. John chapter 5, verse 24 says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believeth uh, in me. He says, listen, you're already passed from death unto life. And so we're not going to come into condemnation. We're not going to be separated. We're not going to Hades. We're going absent from the body, present with the Lord. And therefore, as we close out 2020, uh, whether I make it to 2021 or not, I know one place I will make it. When I die, I'm going to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just like our Lord knew when he died, he was going back to his father. Now that's great news. Praise the Lord. Bible says, and supper being ended, John 13, 2, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now the devil had already done that. And Judas was a willing participant the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, we go back to chapter 12, we look at verses 4 through 6, Judas was a thief, and he had the bag, and he would often take, he would steal money from the, uh, from the, from the, uh, from the bag. He was the one, kind of say like uh, uh, the one who uh, collected the offerings and so forth. So he had the bag, he was a thief. And at the proper time, when he felt this thing was not going to work the way he thought it was going to work, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was not going to be some great political warrior, political hero, and that he would defeat Rome, and that he would, and that Judas himself would be this great person, maybe prime minister or secretary of, of the treasurer. He realized that wasn't going to happen, and now he's ready to betray the Lord. And see, the circumstances didn't change Judas. He was already a traitor. And when things didn't go right, then what he did demonstrated who he already was. So Satan uh, had put it into his heart. But again, Satan didn't force it into his heart in the sense that Judas had uh, no choice. Judas did what his heart dictated to him. He was a willing participant in betraying the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
But the Bible goes on to say that in 13 and 3 of the Gospel of John, Jesus knowing, there again, omniscience, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. That's John 13, 3 and 4. Now notice again, he knew. Jesus knew that he had come from God and he was going to God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we know we were born in sin. We understand that. We know we were not of the family of God, but we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, John says, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what I'm saying is that Jesus knew that he had come from God and he was going to God. And since we have received Christ, we know that since we have received Christ and we're in the family of God now, when we die, we're going to God. So there was a time I was not in the family of God, but for the last 46 years of my life, I have been in God's family in the church, in the body of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And when I die, I know where I'm going. I know exactly where I'm going. And there is no doubt, just like Jesus, he knew where he was going. And so the Bible says, therefore, he's willing to serve. See, what the Bible is, is teaching us here, just like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a Christian, you're a believer in Christ, and when you die, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. If you know that, that ought to change the way you live this Christian life. And so you can be a servant when you understand that you are in the family of God. And so Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and that's kind of a poetic way of telling us that Jesus had already left heaven and laid aside, in a sense, his deity, where there's the independent action in his life. And, he, and what he did, he laid that aside and he put on the form of a servant. A servant. And this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, that he became a servant. And he, a servant unto death. And so if you and I understand that as Christians, that we've got a white robe, a clean, white, beautiful robe in glory, and we're going to have a glorified body, knowing that we ought to be able to serve humanity. And it doesn't matter what people think of us, because we know who we are. Jesus knew who he was and who he is. And my brothers and sisters, when we know who we are, and to whom we belong, then uh, how we live our lives in a humble service field way, so what? It's, we're, we're willing to do that because we know that does not detract from who we really are. Are you with me? It doesn't detract. When you know who you are, you don't have to fight, cuss, get upset, do crazy things. You don't have to do any of that stuff to try to, decide, to try to say, I'm somebody. Because when you realize that who you are in Jesus Christ, you are somebody. So the Bible says in John 13, 5, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which uh, he was girded. Now, Peter understood all this about washing of feet and it was something that a servant, a household servant did. The host or the owner of the house never did those kind of things. He had a servant to do those. So when Jesus, after supper, and when he gets down and he washes their feet and wipes them with a towel, this is why uh, verse, six, verse 6, then he comes to Peter. And when he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? You 
washing my feet? And Jesus answered him and said to him, what I am doing, what I am doing, you do not understand now. Now that is uh, where we, we have started off the message uh, this, this morning. He says, you do not understand. Now, what I want you to know is that Peter understood washing of feet. But what he did not understand was the Savior's demonstration of love. He loved them and he loved them to the end. And so what Jesus says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. See that? You don't know now. And in our Christian lives, that's what God does with us often. He puts us in a, in a situation in our Christian experience. We may not know what in the world is going on or what in Christ is going on. A better way to say that, not in the world. What in Christ is going on? Why are we going through this? What's happening? We don't understand now, but, um, but I'm here to tell you, you will know later. And uh, so our Lord has to put us through situations where we grow and we see things from his perspective. We don't automatically see them. So in John chapter 13 and verse eight, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. So, so Peter's idea is that you, you're my Lord. I call you the teacher and Lord. And so, no, you don't wash my feet. You're above me. And if you're above me, then you don't do this. And so Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If, so in other words, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part, which means you have no fellowship with me. And, and we'll look through this a couple more verses and we'll explain some things here. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he's completely clean and you are clean. And he said, but not all of you. Verse 11, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. He's speaking, he says, the disciples, you're clean, except for Judas. Judas never was a born again believer in Jesus Christ. He never trusted Christ personally as his Lord and Savior. So Peter says, well, if you're going to wash my feet, then Lord, give me a bath. And what Jesus says, you've already been bathed. You have, you've been washed. And this is symbolic way of saying, once you and I as believers, we have been washed and we have been bathed in the blood of Jesus, which is symbolic or symbolized by our baptism. That's why when we baptize and we take a believer and we ask them scripturally for, for proof that they're already a Christian. And then when we take them and baptize them, then we put them down in the water and we take them under the water totally and bring them up out of the water. And it's signifying that you have been washed in the blood of Jesus and you are clean upon your profession of faith. And baptism is just demonstrating that. And so many people don't understand what happens in baptism. Some things think baptism saves. Uh, some things you got to be baptized in a special way. Baptism is portraying my death to the old way of life. And then uh, my when I rise up out of the water, I'm going to live in a new quality of life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is what Jesus is saying. He says, if you're bathed, all you need is to have your feet washed. In other words, every day as we live our Christian life, we, we don't need to go get saved all over again. We're already saved once and forever, once forever. We're saved. And so, but we need to have our feet washed. In other words, as we walk this Christian life, as we order our lives in, uh, in according to the word of God, then there, there needs to be some cleansing of our walk, cleansing of our feet, so to speak. Uh, and so as we walk and we do that through prayer, study of the word, fellowship uh, with the saints, and uh, then 
again, and then going over and being reminded of the Lord's Supper, which is tells us how we were saved by grace through faith. See, the, the big thing about the Lord's Supper, when we take the Lord's Supper, what we're indicating is there's no way we can save ourselves. So we, we go and we take the Lord's Supper. The, the, the elements don't save us, but the reason we're taking them is to demonstrate that I know that I'm not saved by works, and I'm, re, I'm going back and reminding myself of Calvary, Jesus died, he shed his blood, he gave his body, and when I put my trust in him, I am saved. And so that's what uh, baptism and that's what the Lord's Supper is about, a reminder that Jesus Christ has saved us and we cannot save ourselves. Now, once we are reminded of that, we understand that, what that should help us do is that when we live our Christian lives, and we come up upon situations, quit trying to save ourselves because we couldn't save ourselves in the first place and we can't save ourselves in this Christian life by being good enough, wise enough, intelligent enough to do what we're supposed to do. We have to continue to depend upon our Lord and Savior. And so our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, when you've, been, when you've had your bath, now you just need your feet washed. But you are but you are completely clean. And then he knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew who Judas was. And therefore, he says, not every one of those disciples was clean. Now, and uh, verse 12, again, I notice this. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, so he'd washed their feet, takes up his garments, and he sat down again, his garments of service, and he sat down again. And this is the idea. He, what he's doing for them is showing them in a symbolic, demonstrative way. Listen, I came from heaven to earth. I'm a real human being, but I never stopped being God. And so I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. What many? And that's Mark 10, 45, and it's also in, in Matthew. I gave my life a ransom for many. I believe that's Mark 10, 45. And I may have to double check that one, get back with you all on that. I gave my life a ransom for many. Praise God. Who are the many? John 1, 12. As many as received him. And if that's you, you're one of the many that Jesus gave his life as a ransom for Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. So in John 13, 12, so when he had washed their feet, he, he taken his garments. Again, the last part of that is like Jesus was a servant, but he's going to die. And after his death and burial, he's going to be resurrected. And then 40 days later, he's going to ascend to his father. And so when he sat down after serving, you, you see what I'm saying? He, ser he serves, takes the garments of a servant. And when he completes that, he sat down. Our Lord and Savior lived a holy and perfect life. He dies on Calvary, buried, resurrected, ascended, and he's seated. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now, no, they don't understand all this, but he says, you will. You will understand this. So he says to them, he says, do you know, John 13, 12, do you know what I have done to you? And he goes on to explain it. In 1313, because they did not know. Now, again, understand, they knew he had washed their feet. They did not know the greater significance. So our Lord says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Praise God. He says, this is what you call me. Uh, teacher, you call me didaskalos, which means I am your a doctrinal teacher. I am your number one primary doctrinal teacher. You call me the teacher. That's what in John chapter 11, when uh, Martha met Jesus before Mary, and she went to tell Mary, she says, the teacher, our doctrinal primary teacher, number one is here. Praise God. And so Jesus says, you call me teacher and you call me Lord. Lord, and you see, they never called Jesus 
on a, on a first name basis like we do. They never said, uh, let's suppose they're in a, in a group somewhere. They never said, Jesus, I want to ask you a question. They called him Lord. And sometimes they called him teacher. They never called him Jesus. And when we think about that 2,000 years later, uh, we, we, we call him Jesus all the time. But we would hardly ever refer to him as Lord Jesus or Lord first. And it's to me, it's kind of interesting how uh, in, in 2,000 years, because if we were, like people would say, wouldn't it have been good to, to be with Jesus? And if I could have sat down with the disciples and travel with Jesus or to be with Jesus. Well, the first thing is you wouldn't have called him Jesus. You'd have called him Lord. <laughs> Praise God, because that's who he is. And that's what he says here. Not in a negative, mean way, but this is a matter of fact way so we would grow. He says that uh, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. There again, in the Gospel of John, at time after time, it shows us I am. Remember John eight fifty eight before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the I am. He's the I am. Praise the Lord. John 13, 14. He says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, uh, praise God. Notice the difference. John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord. In John 13, 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Because let me tell you something. If he's not your Lord, you won't be taught. We got a lot of we got a lot of craziness, a lot of foolishness, a lot of silliness that uh, goes on in our times. And people, well, Jesus is my Savior, but He's not my Lord. Well, if He's not your Lord, He's not your Savior. You you cannot pick and choose what part of Jesus you want. He's a whole person. He's the God Man. If you don't receive, recognize, surrender, and submit to Him as the God Man and as your Lord, then you're not saved. You're not saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if we shall confess uh, Jesus as Lord, another way of understanding that is that Jesus is our Lord. I'm confessing. He's my Lord. He's Lord. Praise God. He's, he's, he's more than just my buddy. He's my Lord. And so Jesus says in John 13, 14, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. What an indictment. Listen, because he goes on, on and he says in verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Isn't that, a, isn't that amazing? That's, and what an indictment. See, I should do with my brothers and sisters in Christ, doesn't matter whether they're young, old, white or black or Caucasian, or uh, Puerto Rican, or Hispanic, or wh whatever they are, Latino, any group of people, European, it doesn't matter. If Jesus is, is going to wash the disciples' feet, and he's the Lord and teacher, then we who are being taught ought to do the same thing for one another. So when we meet someone, and we find out that brother or sister is a, a born, is a blood-bought born again brother or sister in Christ, then what ought to happen is that we ought to live with him and accept him just the way that our Lord and Savior has accepted us. Praise God. We are accepted in the beloved. And so when we meet a brother, it doesn't matter where his, what his background is. Jesus says, and this is the indictment, because often we say, well, I'm going to pick and choose who I'm going to have fellowship with. I see on the screen, Mark 10, 45, Praise the Lord. So uh, Jesus says that if I washed your feet, then why wouldn't you wash one another's feet? And what he's talking about is not just the act. So we have churches can have, and many churches do have, foot washing services. But deeper than that, remember, Jesus says to Peter, do you understand what I'm doing? Well, yeah, you're washing my feet. I know what that's all about. And so we can have a foot washing ceremony without loving one another. What Jesus was talking about was love because he demonstrated his love toward us and he showed it as he put on the servant's uh, clothing, the servant's uh, uh, clothing. And then after putting on the servant's clothing, he gets down and washes feet. And then after that, he's finished. 
and he puts the, the, the garments off and he sits down. He's showing us his love for Jesus came into the world to die for us and to be resurrected and, uh, and to be ascended so that as Hebrews will say in Hebrews chapter seven, uh, will say that he's able to save them to the uttermost, them who come to God by him. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I thank God I'm a saved brother. And it's not because I was so good. I was so smart. It was because of Jesus Christ and his mission to save me. And then he says, uh, he's given us an example that we should do as he has done. Now, let me just drop way down to uh, John chapter uh, 13, verse 34 and 35. And, and he says this in John chapter 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, a new commandment that you love one another. Well, that commandment's in the Old Testament. And so if it's in the Old Testament, and how is Jesus saying it's a new thing? Because what he's done here in John 13, 13 and 14, 15 and 16, and what he says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Okay, we don't stop there. Because what he says is, as I have loved you. That's what makes it new. As I have loved you. The Old Testament gave us the prescription to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength to love God, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. But Jesus demonstrated it. That's why it's new in quality. He says, as I have done to you, this is, I've done this as an example. This is what you are to do. So love as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's what we're called to do, to love one another. And Jesus demonstrated it. You go back to John 13, 1, having loved his own, which are in the world, he loved them to the end. Praise his holy name. Now, when we talk about loving, many times people say, well, Jesus was God and he was a perfect human being. He's the God man. He can love. So he can love perfectly, but we, but we can't do that. No, we can't do that by ourselves, in our own strength, in our flesh. No, we cannot. But absolutely we can through the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Bible say in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so for you and for me, we can love one another regardless of who they are, or what the situation is, as we yield to the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. And against that, there's no kind of law. So, and it says, and, and when we walk that way in Galatians chapter 5, the, you know, we crucify the flesh. So if we crucify the flesh, put the, put the flesh to death, separating the flesh, my sin nature, from the power of the sin nature, when we separate that by yielding, not to myself, but yielding to the Holy Spirit, when I yield to the Spirit of God and ask him to fill me in Ephesians chapter 5 with his Spirit, the result is I love, love, joy, peace, Love is the result. So I say to any Christian person, if you're a genuine Christian, don't tell me you can't love the way Jesus loves because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter five that what happens is that uh, this, it says that we were without strength. We were sinners. We were enemies, but we were reconciled by the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Romans 5, 5 says, and he shed his love in our hearts, shed his love. The love that Jesus has for us causes us to prayerfully ask for the spirit of God to fill us so that we can love the way Jesus loves. Because if we love in the spirit, we're going to love to the goal of what love is all about. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We can love one another uh, with God's love. John three sixteen love. You know, 1 John 3.16 says this. It says that 
This is love. What is love? This is love. That we would lay down our souls for our brothers and sisters. First John 3, 16. What do you mean we lay down our souls? Lay down your ego. You know, you find out, and I found out in my Christian life, according to John 3, 1 John 3, 16, if I lay aside, as Jesus did, if I lay aside my ego, I can love almost anybody. <laughs> Amen. I, I can love through the power of the Holy Spirit. What happens is my ego gets in the way. When my ego gets in the way, I, say, I ain't putting up with that mess. Heck no. You know, I'm a, he got something else to think about because I ain't, I ain't going there. But we can. And, we, and this is what Jesus says. Love. This is what John records what love is. Herein is love. This is what love is all about. It says that we would lay down our egos, our souls for our brothers. Amen. And when you, when you, get, past, when you get past that, how you get past your feeling. Oh, you know, I feel bad about what was done. And I tell you what, I'm going to get even. You get past your feeling and get into the power of the Holy Spirit. You can love with the power of God's love in your life. Praise the Lord. So Jesus uh, says in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, I kind of forget where I was. Let me go back to 13 and uh, 9 after Peter, it says, or excuse me, John, John, the gospel of John 13 and 8, Jesus says, I mean, Peter said, you should never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part. In other words, no fellowship. See, I can be a saved man, but you know what I need? I, I need to have my feet cleaned. I need day by day through prayer, study of the word, meditation. See, Psalm 1 tells us how to do that. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. If I walk in the counsel of the ungodly, see, I got to, I got to wash that mess off my feet. You know, nor stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that uh, law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So if we stay in the word of God very prayerfully, asking God, to guide us and direct us. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, if in all our ways we acknowledge him, he'll make our path plain. He'll show us how to go from point A to point B. What happens is we stay in fellowship. But if, uh, and that's my concern during this COVID-19 pandemic, is and my, my concern for brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm not uh, saying, I'm not knocking anybody or getting on or criticizing people because they haven't come to church. But my concern is that they are still in the word, Psalm 1, that they're in the word day by day. They're taking advantage of, uh, of our presentations on Facebook, YouTube, and on the, uh, uh, excuse me, what is that? Friendship uh, newsletter. And by the way, uh, sometime next month, what we're going to do is we'll still be on Facebook, but uh, we're going to change from Facebook to, uh, we'll be on Facebook rather, so we're not going to change from Facebook, but we're going to go to uh, the Friendship Newsletter so more people can get it uh, after last week or a week before when we begin to have some problems, uh, the Friendship Newsletter. So you would still be on Facebook, but then uh, you would go to uh, groups. And when you go to groups, uh, if you are a member of the Friendship Baptist Church, you got a newsletter, you look and you'll see the newsletter. And when you click on the newsletter, then uh, you'll be able to catch uh, the sermons and be much, uh, it'll be much easier and we'll be able to impact more people. So what we're looking at is, again, we're saying that uh, Jesus says, if I, don't, if, you, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And he's talking about washing of feet. My brothers and sisters, uh, I'm concerned that people during this, starting back in um, old February and then March, when people stopped coming because of the governor's orders and all, I totally understand that. But if you're not getting into the word of God, then you're not going to remain where you were. You're going to slide back. You won't be going forward. And then you have no real part in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the things that Satan meant for evil in this COVID-19 was to separate us 
so that we would burn out. Just like when you put, uh, you're making a, uh, you get your barbecue uh, uh, coals together. You get those coals together and you put them together and you light them and they stay together. And uh, once one gets lit, another gets lit and they begin to really uh, take off as far as being on fire. But if you move those coals out and separate them, then all of them will burn out. And so we need the fellowship. So in John 13, 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. I think we've gone over this, but verse 11, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken the, his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do uh, as you should do as I have done to you. And then he, he breaks it down with a few more verses and we're going to stop. He says this, he says, most assuredly I say to you, this is John, this is the 16th verse of John chapter 13. Uh, most assuredly or truly, truly, verily, verily I say to you, servant is not greater than his master. And that makes sense. We all understand that. Nor is he who sent, nor is he who is sent, rather, greater than he who sent him. So since Jesus was sending them, he's greater than they are. And he is the, uh, and the, he's the master. He's greater than the servant. So verse 17 says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so understand one of the reasons that, uh, in my calling to teach so that we would know. See, Peter wouldn't know what Jesus was doing unless he's taught. We don't know unless we're taught the word of God. And uh, in my Moody Bible uh, Institute commentary that I got a couple years ago uh, at a conference, I, I took a look at the, this verse, uh, John chapter 13, verse 17, and uh, they made this note. Knowing comes before obeying. Knowing is prerequisite to obeying. If you don't know, you can't obey. And so there are many people in church who've heard this or that, but uh, they don't really know the scripture as they should. So in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, you have heard it was said this and this, but I tell you this, because what they heard was not true. And what they heard was not the, the whole truth. And so they didn't understand things because they had not heard it right. So as a calling, as my calling as a pastor teacher is to help you understand what the word of God is saying. So you can obey, you can obey the word of God. Verse 18, he says, I do not speak concerning all of you. There again, Jesus understood who Judas was. The disciples did not. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, which means chosen as disciples. He says, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread and drinks with me has lifted up his heel against me. Lifted up his heel is a is a is a uh, was a figure of speech. Is saying what has happened is that I know I chose all of you. Go back to John six. I chose you twelve. One of you is diabolos, the devil. One of you is the devil. And here in, in thirteen eighteen, he says, uh, I'm not speaking that all of you are clean. That all of you are going to obey. I know whom I have chosen as disciples, but one of you is going to betray me. Verse 19, he says, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I, there again, there it is, I am, you may believe that I am he. John 8, 24, John 8, 24, John 8, 28, John 8, 24, and John 8, 28. If you don't believe that Jesus is the I am, you will die in your sins. Our Lord made it plain. He made it plain. And so 
He says in verse uh, 20, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Let me stop there at uh, verse 20. Because, so we looked at 20 verses of John chapter 13. And we'll get back into this with uh, Jesus when he said he was troubled in spirit. And yet trouble did not prevent him from being troubled in his soul and his spirit does not prevent him from going to the cross. We'll be troubled at times. Don't let it prevent us from being obedient to what God has called us to do. And uh, so we'll get back into this. Thanks for, for attending. Thanks for listening. And may God bless us as we study the word of God and as we grow, as Peter says. And, and isn't it wonderful when you read uh, Peter at the end of his second book, Second Peter 3.18, he says this. He says, but grow in the knowledge. See, there's a lot of stuff Peter didn't know, but God the Son taught him. And, he, and as he writes his letters, it's interesting and amazing to see how he had grown in the process, and now he understood things that he did not. My brothers and sisters, you've been saved for a while, some maybe a few years, one or two years, others up to 40 or 50 years, but thank God we are learning. So grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our time. Will you bless it to our hearts and lives? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So see you next week, Lord willing. Excuse me. Remember next month, sometime what we're going to start is uh, having our messages on the Friendship Newsletter. So you'll still be on Facebook, but then what you do is go to uh, groups, and then when you get to groups, you go to your uh, uh, groups on, on Facebook. Then you go to the Friendship uh, Newsletter, click in, and you will find the message. Praise God. See you later.